You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Folks in hopes of improved health care and the dread health disparities and inequalities in Washington, D.C., D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser today announced a monumental agreement with Howard University. Through a $225 million tax abatement given by the city, Howard University, in partnership with Adventist Healthcare, will develop a new $450 million, 225-bed, level one trauma and academic teaching hospital on the existing campus with plans to complete it by 2026. Here's today's announcement. We know um, the very important role that Howard's College of Medicine not only pay, plays in our city, um, but in our entire nation. Howard University produces more African-American doctors than any university in the country. And we know um, that by ensuring uh, Howard's success, we have more healthcare professionals of color uh, in uh, our city and our nation. And we know how important it is for the trajectory of African-American health um, to have culturally competent um, professionals and doctors uh, in our city and throughout our country. So we want to thank Howard for all the work that they've done uh, in preparing uh, doctors to serve uh, Washingtonians and Americans. We are also delighted uh, that we could come to this agreement and ensure that for many years, uh, Howard will be able to train the best of the best and the best and brightest uh, to provide that kind of care. So here are some uh, details of uh, what we expect um, to see uh, with Howard University and their partnership with Adventist Healthcare is that by 2026, Howard will rebuild a hospital on their campus that will be a level one trauma center as they are now. Uh, academic teaching hospital will be a 225-bed facility that's 600 square, square feet. Uh, and the current hospital would remain open until a new facility is constructed, and we expect that it will be about a $450 million project. The district uh, is committing uh, to $25 million in public infrastructure support and has committed housing a D.C. government agency at one of the planned new office buildings, uh, in addition uh, to a $225 million tax abatement uh, that would um, that would cover uh, part of the construction time for the hospital. The district is also committing uh, $26.6 million over the next six years to support five centers of excellence at Howard University, uh, and I dare say uh, invest in how uh, these centers of excellence can contribute to healthier outcomes for D.C. residents. Uh, these, uh, six area, these five areas include Include sickle cell, women's health, oral health, trauma and violence prevention, and substance use and co-occurring uh, disorders. And so like at the new hospital in Ward 8, these centers of excellence will provide care and services tailored to the specific um, communities of need. And like the new hospital in Ward 8, the new Howard University Hospital uh, will play a critical role in helping us um, in and put an end to the disparities that we see um, played out with co our response to COVID-19. Greg Carr, this is obviously important not only to Washington, D.C., to this HBCU, but uh, it speaks again to the value of uh, African-Americans who understand and are involved with the health of black people. So what's happening with Howard, what's happening with Meharry, what happens with Xavier uh, in New Orleans, uh, what happens with what North Carolina A&T is doing uh, in other parts of the country? No, absolutely. Uh, in fact, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, George Washington, in partnership with United Medical Center, uh, moves east of the river for the Ward 8 Hospital. There's been a huge struggle over that. Howard at one time was involved in, in that conversation. And Howard stays west of the river in northwest in a white-hot gentrifier's market. So uh, this is a huge conversation because, in part, it, it reflects uh, Howard University. And, of course, kudos to the leadership, Dr. Frederick, all the folks involved for threading a very tight needle 
because the Howard Hospital, which sits on what used to be Old Griffin Stadium, is in one of the most rapidly gentrifying parts of the District of Columbia, and developers have wanted that property for years. So to, for Howard to be able to not only hold on to that property, but to have the, uh, the the capital now and the tax abatement and the infusion to construct the hospital and then perhaps even monetize that corner, but to retain ownership in a city that is rapidly becoming increasingly non-black and brown sends a signal that it can be done. But what you mentioned in terms of this network, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse School of Medicine, Xavier, this country, as the demographics shift, are going to have to is going to have to rely more and more on medical professionals that look like that population. And so this sends the signal that not only can it be done, but that when you have elected leadership, be the mayor, be it the majority black city council of Washington, DC, you can get these kind of deals done because that's the type of combination of public-private partnership and elected officials that's going to have to be required in order to get something like this done. Um, uh, Reese, um, when we talk about, again, uh, how our institutions matter, I mean, I was just talking about infrastructure. I was just talking about those different things. This is how you use your collective power. How a university plays just as a critical role in Washington, D.C., as George Washington University, as Georgetown, uh, as a university of the District of Columbia. Uh, and so if I'm in Houston, I'm saying the exact same thing about Texas Southern and the University of Houston. If I'm saying the exact same thing, if you cannot talk about Georgia, you can talk all you want about Georgia State University, but you can't talk about Georgia unless you deal with Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, Atlanta. Uh, and so, again, this is where this is where again, getting getting out of national politics. This is where African-Americans have to also uh, flex that power when it comes to African-Americans who are mayors, who are on city councils, who are county commissioners to ensure that our institutions are being properly taken care of. I absolutely agree. I think that when we have black elected officials, we see our communities being, t you know, being taken care of in a much different way than when we don't have black elected officials. But I do want to emphasize that white officials represent a lot of black Americans as well, and we have to yield our power with them. We can't only, all, we can't mostly and only hold black elected officials accountable. And meanwhile, the white elected officials don't, don't even have to give us a second glance. I mean, the people that get the hardest time from black people are black elected officials. And, you know, I see more complaints about the CBC than I do about the Republican Party in like social media, for example. And so we have to flex our muscle as voters, as taxpayers on all elected officials, because we do hold the power. And when we have black elected officials, when that opportunity is there to put black people in power, we should absolutely seize that because we're going to get better results. But we have to be calling up mayors that are white mayors, if it's local county officials, whether it's your uh, congressional people, your senator, governors, whatever, hold everybody accountable and make sure you make your priorities known. I keep saying that we are still constituents. So it doesn't matter where yes. we are, it doesn't matter who the leadership is, we are constituents. And so we utilize our infrastructure, we utilize our organizations to then go as one voice. You know, and look, I've spoken to AKs and Alphas and Deltas and others, and I've said, I'm sorry, there should be no city in America that when they see pink and green, they don't list to go, okay, I don't know, okay, here come them AKs. If I see red and white, here come those Deltas. If I see black and gold, here come those Alphas. It doesn't make sense. I got keep saying it doesn't make sense for us to have organizational infrastructure and we don't use it. This is also where, and I'll see it right now, which is why we we have hashtag HBCU Giving Day. This is also where Howard graduates can't just be excited about this. They've also got to ensure that they're cutting a check every year in terms of dues. I don't care if it's ten dollars, twenty five dollars, a hundred dollars, doesn't matter because you but you can't just keep saying. Who else is going to save us if we're unwilling to save ourselves? Oh, yes. And that's the hour that we're in. And I'm thinking about in Georgia as well, Albany State University and Fort Valley State University that have agricultural programs. So thinking about the connection of food and medicine. And, and when we talk about um, I, while we were on the phone, the CBC sent another reminder about another town hall that they're going to be having on Monday addressing the frontline workers and um, addressing first responders. So, again, as Reese said, it is about understanding that you are a constituent and that 
whoever it is that is representing you is representing you at the fullest in your community. And uh, we do largely see that with black elected officials, but honestly, uh, it, it all cuts the same way. So uh, the energy that people have, especially since we're at a shelter in place, this is the perfect time to really get to know your local community and state, because this is one of the ways with which people are able to learn that, but then to actually put those things into action by way, as you mentioned, a cutting a check. Um, if you're not able to cut a check, then you should be able to lend your voice. But it's going to take us to get us to a place where we're actually seeing um, what we call freedom. Every single night. We've got some of the top black experts. You're not going to see them on cable news or broadcast news because you swear black people aren't experts when it comes to this health crisis. That's why we have this show and why we do what we do every day on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Joining us right now is retired General Russell Honoré. Uh, thanks for the Black Surgeon General, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. John Hope Bryan, he is the founder of Operation Hope. Senator Kamala Harris of California. Dr. Sadrina Calder, retired General Lloyd Austin. Congresswoman Karen Bass, Commissioner Omari Hardick. Bureau President in Brooklyn, Eric Adams. Dr. Joseph Graves, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens. Dr. Mm -hmm. Corey A. Bear, Patel Salt. Uh, Howard University student, Pastor Jamal Bryant, a uh, doctor, uh, Christy McDowell, Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Gilda Daniels, again, author of the book, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Four stars, uh, General Kip Ward, Dr. Oliver Brooks, is president of the National Medical Association, president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, Joby Benjamin, Dr. Alexia Gaffney, infectious disease specialist, Dr. George S. Benjamin, uh, executive director of the American, American Public Health Association, Malcolm Nance, family medicine physician Dr. Jen Caudle, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, a molecular biologist, Kat Stafford. She's a national race and ethnicity reporter for the Associated Press. Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University, Congresswoman Yvette Clark uh, from the state of New York, William Spring, AFL-CIO economist, uh, Andrea James, executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. All right, let's go to Capitol Hill. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congresswoman Anna Bernice Johnson of Texas, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Minnesota Senior. Amy Klobuchar, mental health clinician, Jamie Singletary, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Brave Boy, as well as Dylan uh, Harry, ACLU Justice Division strategist. Uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, uh, she is a virologist, Principal Steve Perry of Capital Prep. Health and wellness specialist, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, Desmond Mead, President of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Cliff Albright, who is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Michael Harriet with the group, the Mina McWhorter, founder of Love by the Hand, Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, Merida Bennett College. Corner Michael Fowler is the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, mental health therapist Suzette Clark, Justin Gibney, attorney and political strategist, and Bishop Vincent Matthews Jr., Dr. Suzette McKinney, CEO and executive director of the Illinois Medical District, Dr. Leon Madugo, president elect of the National Medical Association, Jana Bailey, Mayor of Moss Point, uh, Mississippi, uh, Mario King. We're going to keep driving this thing to make sure our people are fully aware, safe, protected from coronavirus. You get the top medical experts, the top business experts, top political experts, top religious experts, because that's why we do what we do, unapologetically and unfiltered. Ain't nobody else in the black media space doing what we do. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.